Hi, I'm Hannah Brown and I'm Head of Content at eResidency. In this conversation, I chatted with eResident Maya Middlemiss, who is a British national living in Spain. Maya is a freelance journalist, podcaster and content creator who founded her Estonian company Blocksparks to support her content activities for global clients. In our conversation, we covered a wide range of topics. We covered the features and perks of being a solopreneur. Maya explained how having an Estonian private limited company can support solopreneurs and freelancers to be more professional and legitimate. And finally, she gave her take on some trends to look out for in 2023 on the broader global uh, future of work topic. So please enjoy this third video in our series, Conversations with eResidents. Hi, Maya. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for joining us on Conversations with eResidents. It's wonderful to be here. It's an interesting project, and I'm always glad to get involved with anything eResidency is doing. Yeah, we, we are going to actually talk a little bit about that because you do some work with us, uh, which mm -hmm. I think would be great to get into a little bit later. But uh, before we get there, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you um, how you came to be, a, I think, a solopreneur, a freelancer, an entrepreneur, if you were as well. So maybe you can give us a little bit of background about um, how, how you are, where you are today. Sure. Yes. Well, um, I grew up in London. And I ended up working remotely back in 2000, um, which I can always date very clearly by my millennium baby, who is now <laughs> not a baby at all. <laughs> She's towering over me. Um, and I was I was employed basically at the time, but I ended up moving to Spain with my family when they were quite young in 2009. And at the time we brought the work with us. My husband ended up working in the same business and that was great. And when we decided we wanted to stay here long term, I found my work transitioning more to writing and consulting. And I eventually went full time freelance in 2017, it was. And then early in 2018, I had the opportunity to go for a larger contract with a US company, but they would only contract with a proper business. They would, couldn't work with a freelancer in Europe for whatever legal and contractual reasons. I was also working at the time for lots of very exciting, but um, quite flaky, sometimes emergent technology startups in the blockchain space. And I wanted a new level of professionalism with which to contract with them and try and oblige them to pay me and things like that. And that led me to discover Estonian e-residency. So that was from the blockchain connection side initially. And then suddenly when I, I had to contract with this big organization, I realized that was going to be the quickest and most straightforward way to do it because opening a limited company in Spain is, I've done it once. <laughs> I didn't fancy doing it again. It's very, and there's no way I could have got it done in a month, which I, I did with e-residency. And yeah, it was quite interesting reflecting on that yesterday as I went back up to Madrid to connect my renewed e-residency kit, <laughs> which I was able to do yesterday after five years. So that showed that it did actually work out quite well for me. And, you know, I kept the limited company on. At one point, I thought I might grow a team with it. And then I've ended up quite happily freelancing, solopreneuring, consulting in an extremely flexible way that suits me ever so well. And it's really only in the last year or so I've ended up working with quite a lot of um, Estonian clients, including your good self. So that's quite interesting the way that circled back to Estonia after it began purely digitally. So you've mentioned solopreneurship. I, I also uh, probably mentioned it in my question as well. But what are some of the advantages that you think solopreneurship can can provide? I think it's interesting. Certainly, you know, over the last couple of decades, growing professionally has always been seen as growing a team and mm -hmm. scaling up and hiring people to magnify yourself by sort of growing out of your role and taking in people to spread the load out. I believe there are other ways to grow and deepen your professional practice and to see the work you do in a more professional light. And one of those is to become a business of one rather than a freelancer. Um, I mean, nothing wrong with freelancing and it's, it's extremely flexible and it suits many people very well. But I knew that I wanted my clients to see me as a partner in achieving their goals and somebody that they could truly work alongside rather than just subcontract things to. Mm -hmm. um, for me, 
approaching that as a professional, somebody who's continually investing in my own professional development and learning, for example, is one of the things that I see being a solopreneur as distinct from being a freelancer. I also think it's easier as a solopreneur to think about the value you add to your clients and also about building a business of one. For example, I'm working on a community project in Spain locally, which I hope will develop some kind of sustainable, I'm not going to say the word passive income because it never is, it's always hard work, but (laughs) to see a way of growing different income streams, different activities, and being able to orient all of that around a a changing, fast-moving situation, particularly if your beat happens to be something like future of work, which is always changing. And you've written on these topics quite extensively. I know you Mm -hmm. have written books uh, of your own, but also you've written for the e-residency blog. And so um, my next question is uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit more about your e-residency journey and how e-residency has helped you as a solopreneur and 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 how it's a good business solution for solo operators like you've like bringing out the advantages that you've just mentioned yeah sure well i think i mean the limited company structure i the main main example i know best is spain but i think it's often a case in other countries as well particularly in europe it's designed for scaling up and as such the bar to entry is quite high mm-hmm. you know you've got to fork out masses of share capital and it takes time and you have complex contracting and legal services just to be able to incorporate an entity that somebody on the other side of the world can easily contract with and it's the limited liability as well is mm-hmm. also really important you know i write for clients i might never meet we live in a weirdly litigious society. I think there's there's no way I could insure myself against every possible risk with the things that I'm creating on behalf of clients. Luckily, that's it's never happened. But you know, I think that the the value of limited liability is something that a lot of people don't appreciate, maybe and until they come up against it or until they try to get a quote for professional indemnity insurance when they're working with emergent startups because mm. it's just impossible. Mm. So I think e-residency makes that possible for a business of one to do Mm -hmm. in a very fast very flexible and very affordable way and it's a model that I've not really come across anywhere else when I was looking at my options back five years ago I did look at incorporating in the UK as a number of um, immigrant entrepreneurs in Spain have done but at the time let's just say it was politically sensitive and there were a lot of unknowns and we won't go into that but I thought for me, it was more important to have a foothold in Europe, in the Eurozone and not be tied financially to the UK. If anyone's interested, I actually just published this week a blog post comparing Estonia and the UK for starting a limited liability company. Mm -hmm. And actually, interestingly enough, it's not that different from a setup perspective. So you can still set up online. It's actually a little bit cheaper to start a Mm -hmm. company in the UK. But I think where Estonia might be slightly ahead is the um, the fact that accounting services and service providers are much cheaper in the long run. So you'll save money long term, which yeah. is, I think, very important for solo operators. Um, and also this remote access with your digital ID, which gives you this sort of secure um, way of, of running your managing your business. Yeah, there's nothing but- quite like that anywhere else, I don't think. <laughs> No, I don't. I think it's still maybe, maybe Singapore, maybe. I don't know. I, I, we've, we've got some research coming like in that. Singapore. There <laughs> it I is. I just brought this home yesterday from from Madrid in my handbag. So now I have to figure out what I need to change and update. <laughs> and hot off the press, how was the pickup uh, process yesterday? Absolutely fine. Yep. Um, I think it was in the same place as before. As I say, it was five years. The Estonian embassy in Madrid is absolutely tiny and it's in this very posh shopping district. So, you know, I nearly had to pop in on Bulgari or Hermes um, <laughs> downstairs. Um, and it's just up, up a flight of stairs into a little office where it, the whole thing, you know, it's really momentous when you're starting a new business, but you're in and out in two minutes. <laughs> you just sign for your kit and have your fingerprints scanned. I've seen the fingerprints were the same as they were five years ago. And it's always a good sign. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and then I was done. So I was able to take myself off for some nice lunch and a museum trip in the capital before getting the train home again. Oh, wonderful. Oh, I love Madrid. Did you go to the Prado or a different museum? No, no, I didn't. I'd done all, all that. 
you know, uh, over Many the time. Times. I went to, there was a an exhibition uh, of Velasquez focused on the Meninas, but it was all uh, sort of light show tech enabled. And so having a sort of meeting with a hologram Velasquez explaining the mathematical proportions. Of oh, how cool. Heads. So it was actually amazing. Yeah. I'm not great at fine art appreciation. I really do go well with a good gimmick, um, a bit of gadgetry. So that was fun. Well, I'm going to do a really bad segue here, but speaking of gadgetry and tech, <laughs> um, maybe you can tell us what your businesses are doing <laughs> and what you're well, what you're working for with Blocksparks. Yes, I mean, I I went for the name Blocksparks because at the time, five years ago, I was working with a lot of blockchain companies, um, but I've become quite interested in the whole kind of emergent technology scene as it relates to business. And I still work occasionally for blockchain startups. They are fewer and further than they were between at the time. And it, it's very cyclical. A year or so ago, there was, you know, this time last year, I was working on a number of startups, white papers and things, um, whereas now it's all a bit dead in the water. But the other aspect that became very important to my business over the last few years was future of work. Mm -hmm. Because I've been working remotely for a couple of decades now, I certainly didn't realize back in the early 2000s that I was acquiring knowledge and expertise in remote working because that simply wasn't a thing. I simply managed to persuade somebody that I'd rather not go to their office after my kid was born. So, you know, I didn't realize until it was actually a valuable way ahead of your time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, oh, you've been managing remote teams for 15 years. That's actually useful. So I moved into consulting and writing about future of work issues and then the collaboration technology that boomed during the pandemic lockdowns and you know suddenly everybody was getting funded everybody needed content about everybody was releasing software very like the one we're using today in fact you know there's now thousands of different ways to do what we're doing and that's seeing some retrenchment now obviously because everybody who got funded in 2021 it's overhired and everything else um, but now we're starting to see new waves of the future of work coming out, which is really intriguing me around borderless ways of doing business, of which e-residency e is very much in the vanguard. But things like digital nomad visas and the work from anywhere movement, now that people have gone through that transition of being forced to work from home, and, oh, we could never do that. Oh, actually, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's not one major enterprise around the world that actually stopped working during 2020. They all made it work. And now they can't tell their people, well, you know, we don't work like that or this doesn't work for us. So those people are now saying, hang on a minute. What do I want from my life? Um, I, you know, I spend a year locked in my house. Where do I want to be going forward? And they're starting to demand solutions from technology to regulatory change that's going to facilitate that. So I feel for me, that's the most exciting area right now is where is all that going to go? Are we truly going to achieve work from anywhere? There are a huge amount of hurdles to overcome. And as usual, the technology is way out in front of the regulation and compliance and social policy that needs to go with it. So that's a very exciting area to be writing and talking about. And solopreneurship is right at the heart of that yeah. because it's individuals who are driving it. And now, you know, we were talking last year about the great resignation and now that's shifting more to a dialogue about reshuffling mm -hmm. and change. People still need to work. They still need to eat. But do they really want to work for an employer who's going to dictate where they have to do that and that they have to commute to a central office or they're allowed to work from home twice a week or something you know this whole hybrid thing that was the word of the year last year I'm really glad to see that being kicked into the long grass is absolutely the worst of both worlds that you have to rent somewhere on the edge of a, a big expensive city and accommodate a, a home working desk for twice a week so we're starting to see people really push back on that and start to demand now they've got to know what works for them in terms of where they work most happily and productively. And so I think the social change that comes along on the back of the technological change is one of the most fascinating stories to be telling. And you recently um, wrote an article on this, this sort of state of, on, state of solopreneurship, sorry, uh, for the residency blog. And you mentioned some of, some of those points. And another point that you make in there, which I found really interesting, is how, it's, how um, organizations are now shifting to rather than hiring employees, full-time employees, they're, they're maybe making better use of solopreneurs, knowledge workers to uh, do um, tasks that maybe in the past full-time staff were doing that actually can be done from anywhere 
in less than five days a week. Mm. Um, and I th I find this fascinating. So maybe could you maybe I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but could you maybe just uh, talk a little bit about that? Because I find it really interesting. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's organizations too, particularly the more progressive and agile ones are responding to the changes that the last few years have brought them. And the ones who are going to succeed and come out of this are the ones that are using that to develop resilience and flexibility and think about new ways to deliver, whether that means we don't have this 10 year lease on this massive building, or we don't create this employment liability of hiring a big team of people when we actually have some very specific deliverables to simply look more flexibly about how that could be accomplished. Do I hire an agency to do it? Do I contract with a number of freelancers who can give that very specific expertise that it's needed for those particular hours um, or ideally for those particular results? And it's actually, it's much better for the organization as well, because when you see the, the amount of layoffs that are going on now through this awful process of overhiring where, you know, large tech firms are admitting that they kind of, yes, we overhired by 15% last year because we could, because we had all this money. And it was kind of redundancy for them to simply, we'll, we'll pick the best and move yeah. on from that. But those are real people. And, you know, they've got families and mortgages and some of them have got immigration visas and they're caught up in all of this. So it's so much better on both sides if people can think flexibly about it and have a really honest dialogue about it as well. You know, when you're interviewing somebody for a role rather than asking them about what they're going to be doing in five years time and how they see their progress within the company to talk about their personal goals and aspirations. What do you need from us? Mm. What can we give you that will make you satisfied and creative and make you really want to deliver and align yourself with our goals? And, you know, at what point do we walk along that path together at what point did we might go our separate ways but mm -hmm. or converge again later on we're going to have to accept more fluidity I think in in day-to-day -day life and decision making that's hard for a lot of traditional managers just as it was really hard for them to suddenly be managing teams of people they couldn't see in 2020 yes they're yes. going to have to manage a whole new other way now and it's difficult and you know I think they're going to need more training more consulting and how to do that but also there's just a certain amount of personal courage, I think, to let go and give people that freedom to work how and where they want to and to start to manage that work around deliverables and outputs rather than contracted hours. I mean, this whole idea of the nine to five and 40 hour week or something. We're not on a production line making Fords. <laughs> you know, we're knowledge workers adding value in the new economy. And it's, it's really this shakeup was long overdue. Yeah, and we're seeing also a lot of, um, you know, employers of record, um, mm. tech built around this kind of new model coming yeah. out. Uh, we have a few even on the e-residency marketplace who are um, who, who, who are working in this space to try and make it easier for companies to hire remotely, not necessarily employees, but contractors. But obviously mm. with the old systems of tax and the old systems of banking and these kinds of things, there are definitely... Uh, <laughs> some uh, some traditions that need to be ironed out, not just with the people, but with the with the systems as well. I think. Yeah. Yes, and it's those boundaries where the old and the new. I mean, this was exactly the same working with blockchain and crypto companies. You know, they they're within their ecosystem. Everything's perfect and logical, but it's that interface with the traditional banking and exchanges, and you have exactly the same thing mm -hmm. with startups who want to work in an extremely flexible and results-driven basis, but then they've got to figure out well, what kind of contract do we make with these people? <laughs> and you know, what do we do if they want to then go and live in a different continent and so on? So it's great to see solutions emerging like the employers of record who have again had a boom sort of a year or so behind the collaboration apps came the wave of funding mm -hmm. for all these different payment and regulation solutions. And yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see how that evolution shakes down. It's particularly interesting in Spain because it simply didn't exist yeah. um, a couple of years ago. It's still quite um, a traditional uh, work labor labor market there. Yeah. Yes, it is. It, it is. It's, it's due for a shakeup. And there are lots of reasons. Um, I was talking to somebody recently who has the option of being self-employed in Spain or contracting through an EOR. And she'll actually be slightly worse off financially working with the EOR, but she'll have a rental contract. Mm -hmm. um, no, she'll have an 
an employment contract, sorry, which actually makes it so much easier to get a rental around here. You can't get an apartment in Valencia um, without a pay slip, even if you've got freelance income of three times the size. The it's it's very difficult to apply for a mortgage. There's all sorts of things that are still mm-hmm. oriented around traditional yeah. employment models. Having a contract. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I I do in, think yeah, yeah it's, it's another reason that maybe having a limited company, a business mm-hmm. to show accounts from rather than I'm a freelancer, um, can actually help. Nothing quite as solid as a, as a pay slip in your hand or that you can simply download from your EOR and print out to show the bank or the prospective landlord. Um, mm-hmm. But there are people are going to have to get used to new ways of demonstrating income and reliability and results. So so just to, um, to stop here for a minute, um, because there might be some uh, people out there, either they're already e-residents or... Maybe they're mm-hmm. thinking about e-residency and they, they like the sound of this um, way of working, having their having their limited company, being able to contract their services or work, you know, part, in partnership with different clients uh, on different types of work. Do you think e-residency is, uh, is, a, good, is a good solution for them? Um, and do you have any advice for them? I think absolutely. If you're if you're thinking about freelancing or gig work, but you want to be taken seriously, you want to be treated like a professional rather than a gig worker, then e-residency is the perfect vehicle through which to raise your game. You can even, I'm not suggesting anyone should be deceptive, but you can imply a greater presence within your organization, or you could be subcontracting to other solopreneurs. It certainly doesn't mean you have to work in a vacuum on your own. But just to have that structure whereby you're issuing contracts as a legal entity rather than an individual. I mean, I've, I think it's helped me get paid mm. on occasion that people realize that they're getting a, you know, a, a proper invoice from, uh, which can be automatically reminded and things like that. I think it's so freelancers have often got a bad deal and been treated badly, been at the bottom of the pile for payments and so on. If, if a company gets into trouble, I think there are, so many advantages for just having that professional structure wrapped around you. And actually for me in Spain, you know, I needed that company back five years ago, but why have I just renewed it? Well, I've kept it going for all the reasons we've just discussed. And there are also quite practical ones as well, that it's simply very easy and straightforward to do the admin. Um, I can, things like filing expenses, it's incredibly difficult in Spain as a freelancer, you've got to justify in blood why you you know and any oh you didn't get your your financial number on that invoice or you have Mm -hmm. to contact the airline and try and get a proper invoice with your id number on it whereas with estonia i can simply say well obviously i failed a business trip on that date that was how i got there so yes you're happy to accept the the airline receipt as proof that that's associated with that trip and things like that make it so much easier as as a journalist there are a number of subscriptions and things that it, it's almost impossible to expense in spain to say that i need to read this publication every week or you know i need certain technology to do my job oh well we have to amortize that over how, how many years and something what can, you know can i just have the money back no <laughs> <laughs> so things like that make it so much easier doing business in estonia and living in spain and um What's next for you and for Blocksparks and what are you hoping 2023 brings? Oh, well, I I think the whole Business Without Borders theme is going to be huge this year. So I'm looking forward to carrying on with the Future is Freelance podcast and talking to people who are doing interesting things in that space. Um, I hope that's going to involve travel to events and projects. I'm off to Madeira next week to a digital nomad conference where it's going to be focused on the role of islands and small communities as opposed to the sort of traditional big city hubs. So I think that's absolutely fascinating, the choices people are making there. I'm also focusing a lot on Spain this year because it's really interesting for me, having been here a long time, the last financial crisis, I saw so many people having to walk away from what they were doing here. So many Brits ended up losing everything, including their homes sometimes. And I was working remotely then, but I couldn't do anything to help them. There weren't remote jobs. Mm. There weren't employers of records. There wasn't Estonian residency. There wasn't anything um, to help these people if they, if they lost their main source of income or their bar closed down or whatever. So now I feel that the options are there. And as things get flaky economically, again, I'm building the remote work Spain community 
right. to try and give people access to the jobs and opportunities that are out there. And, you know, remote work isn't for everybody. But if you are living somewhere because you love it, because you've chosen it, then remote work can be the key to sustaining that. Mm -hmm. And you might have moved to Spain from the UK for a job and then that job ceases to be. Then what? You know, a lot of people aren't able to work in Spanish. I mean, God, I'd struggle to get a job with my Spanish if, if it depended on that. But what some people don't realize is that being born as a, as a native English speaker actually gives you an advantage over the whole world when it comes to working online. It's it an incredibly unfair advantage. Being young and having no experience actually means you, you've got native knowledge of social networks that you know, people in my generation are struggling to keep up with. So to try and help people find those advantages and leverage them to work for people who need work doing, which they might never have heard of, yes. never have thought of, it, it it seems to me that the moment is here for that. So I want to do more of that kind of stuff with Remote Work Spain this year. I think the trigger for that was about a year ago, seeing somebody on my little local town Facebook group mm. posting, does anybody know about work they could do from home? And I thought, People don't get it. They don't understand why. <laughs> you know, this is not where you are. Oh, hang on a minute. I need to back right up and start with some much more educational content. And it's been a great journey. And so we're building a really strong community there. It might lead to some face-to-face -face events and other things. So, And the trigger has also been the new digital nomad visa in Spain yeah, as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that will, um, it's, it's upset a lot of people that it won't help existing residents um, and it it's more of a remote work visa as okay. a lot of them are it's really aimed at kind of long-term settlers who get certain tax advantages and you but you have to bring serious income with you and yeah I think the income requirements are quite high I don't think yeah. they're as high as the Estonian ones I have to say but they're still quite high I think it's fair enough you know Countries are opening up their borders to a wave of, of immigrants in a way that is quite threatening, new. potentially. It's new, yeah. it's untested. Obviously, they want those people to bring income with them and to have some kind of guarantees that they won't end up being a burden on the state once they've achieved whatever residency permission that it comes with. So, you know, I think countries are having to absorb so many migrants from yeah. all over the world and that's not going to stop and you know people are having to think about that do we want more there's there's already a bit of a backlash against digital nomads in some communities we're starting to see um, digital nomads get blamed for all sorts of things because they're visible and they're new yeah. and I don't think digital nomads really created a housing crisis or double digit inflation or, or whatever is going on in certain hot spots around the world but I think it's fair enough that people should be expected to pay their way Yes. And contribute in a net positive way to the place they end up. But I really hope that we're going to see outcomes that aren't all about the financial contribution as well, that we can see more cultural integration, people staying for a bit longer, people giving back, um, people spending more than money in those communities they're settling in. And again, it's going with this change in the digital nomad typical profile that it's not a 20 year old with you know, some kind of design or programming lifestyle and they're hopping around from here to there we're starting to see an older demographic people who are mm -hmm. settling staying for a bit longer sometimes families people who do want to put down roots for a year or two and that's a good fit with a lot of the visas that are emerging including the Spain ones so it's yeah it's going to be great to see that emerging and unfolding over the next few years it certainly is um so Maya we're getting to the end um and i have a few rapid fire questions but before i get there is there anything that you're looking for from the audience or um maybe uh you can tell people how they can contact you and or block sparks if they're interested in finding out more or, or working with you absolutely well yes i'm a freelancer i'll never turn down the chance to shamelessly pitch my services <laughs> <laughs> the best place to connect with me is linkedin but i am maya middle miss everywhere when I say everywhere, it's basically Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, um, but if you do find my name, that's probably me because I think I'm the only one online. So you can find my articles and portfolio. I'm always interested in creating interesting copy and telling stories about anything new that needs explaining to an audience, whether that's through through writing, through blogging, articles, journalism, brand journalism, podcasting, webinars. 
um, anything to do with the future of work, remote work, emergent technology, and how those changes impact on society and the way we interact with each other is something I'm really interested in. So I would love to hear from fellow e-residents doing exciting things anyway. So please hit me up and connect and maybe we'll get the chance to work together as well. And I will add some of the links in the description to this video. And also um, just wanted to be a reference, <laughs> a live <laughs> reference, you, because Myra and I do work with each other um, for the e-residency blog. And she's fantastic to work with and very timely. And we've uh, we've had an interesting collaboration over the last few years. So absolutely just uh, want to want to say that. Um, yeah, well, that's really wonderful. I love getting client testimonials. I don't think I've ever had one on a live video before. <laughs> so that's made my day. Thank you, Hannah. Well, you've taken the time today. So it's only it's only fair, I think. Um, yeah. We've, you've written some great content for the blog on, I think, DAOs and I, I, I seem to give you all the most random topics. So oh, yeah. the more random and geeky, the better. Bring it on. OK, good. <laughs> so let's start, go with the uh, four rapid fire questions at the end. So the first question I have is, do you prefer using your e-residency digital ID card or do you use Smart ID? Oh, smart idea. hundred percent. Yes. I don't think the card's been out of the drawer um, for a long time. In fact, I nearly managed to screw up my whole e-identity last year, trying to file my annual report, which is the one time you need the one the time you needed. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's like it's about to get locked out for the third time. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Oh, yes. There is another set of pins somewhere I had to go and find where I'd secretly written them down. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have a podcast, blog or video recommendation for the audience? Um, oh, there are so many great podcasts about the future of work. Um, I would simply search that out. In terms of the podcast I recommend most often to people just in business and in life generally is The Economist, The Intelligence Podcast, because mm -hmm. it's about 20 minutes long. It's every day. Mm -hmm. um, it gets me away from my desk and having a short walk, whatever the weather, I can do 20 minutes of just news and current affairs and really interesting stories from around the world so I listen to a lot of others very much more in my professional niche but that's the one that kind of makes me realize there's a big world out there and there is stuff going on and you know cultural stories and obituaries and all sorts of interesting things that I'd never come across otherwise so I would check that one out yeah I also listen to that one every now and then it, they go into a bit more detail about the headlines so mm. it's not so sort of fast paced they, no, they it's they just take a couple of interesting yeah. stories each day that you mm -hmm. probably wouldn't read otherwise mm -hmm. so uh your preferred location and work setup <laughs> well i i started remote working when it basically meant working from home you know we didn't have co-workings and places like that back in 2000 so i'm still working from home and that's definitely where i do most of my work um but i can work from anywhere and, you know, my preferred setup is my nice big monitor and my desk and all my colored highlighters and my paper planner and everything. And, it, you know, it's it's quite old school, really. But I'm I like working from different places. It's and it's inspiring. So you'll find me at home probably like 80, 90 percent of the time. And but there are nice cafes and coffee shops near here. So and when I'm traveling, obviously, I take my little MacBook and I'm happy to set up anywhere. And hopefully we'll see you in Estonia soon um, this yeah, year. I hope so. Yes, crossed. I'd like to get over for Latitude. Um, I just need someone to commission a few articles. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that topic, uh, how do you describe your connection to Estonia as a new resident? Well, there wasn't really much at all when I became an e-resident. It was literally, oh, I've heard they've got this blockchain ID thing and I can start a business fast. Okay, and do that. Um, but over the last couple of years well I think was it about three years ago I started working with you it was I think so it was yeah I started in 2019 so it was yeah. not long after that yeah I ended up writing about Estonia a few times on, on the blockchain side of things including mm. a feature ab about the extra technology and I think that led me to working with you um, and then over the last year, I've been working with Zolo, who are my business service provider in Estonia, and I've been writing lots of content for them and podcasting with them. So I've actually ended up with a lot of my business being very Estonian, which is great as far as the Spanish tax authorities are concerned. It's really proof that it was proper Estonian business all along. Yes. That they can take no interest in. Um, but it's 
I really, I'd love to say I planned it that way, but I'll be perfectly honest as, as a, a freelancer at heart, it's not always that strategic. I, I come across an interesting connection or a conversation or an opportunity and that's the direction it goes in. So I haven't visited Estonia since the BC days. <laughs> so I'm, I'm long overdue a visit. I'd really like to get back there. I hope you don't mind if I wait till later in the year when it's a little bit warmer because actually it's it time to was come. freezing yesterday. I don't think I can quite handle Tallinn at the moment. No, it's, it's the best time to come when it's warm and yes. there's lots of daylight. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Maya, for the time today. Um, it was really fascinating. And I think that um, there will be a lot of people in the audience who are really interested in your practical uh, assessment of both e-residency and solopreneurship and how the two fit together. Um, so I think it's been really helpful. Um, maybe we need to do a blog post, uh, you know. <laughs> I'll add it to the list. <laughs> uh, no, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for inviting yeah. me. And thank you everyone for watching and listening. I hope you learned as much as I did today.